and welcome to a completely casual, informal, fireside chat kind of episode of Ben's Junk. Now, a few years ago, I did another Ben's Junk on the B-movies and cult classics in my video collection, and that collection has grown considerably since then. And I'm going to try and avoid any overlap with the crappy, blurry, original collection video. And I guess I'll put a link to it in the video description if you want to torture yourself with it. But uh, yeah, let's just talk movies for a bit today. Now, uh, once again, this is mostly going to be a lot of VHS tapes, but I've also got some DVDs in here as well. I mean, uh, DVDs aren't getting any newer. Might as well start folding them into the archive. And let's start with the DVDs. So, it wouldn't be a cult movie collection without some Ed Wood, and I've got this box set, and I think more diehard viewers have seen this on my shelf at some point. But it's all of uh, Wood's more mainstream movies, uh, as mainstream as he got, so uh, none of the adult stuff, at least. And, uh, yeah, Image Entertainment kind of went a little overboard with the intentionally tacky packaging. And, of course, it being Ed Wood, we had to have some kind of Angora-looking uh, thing. No texture, of course. But, uh, yeah, I, I bought this for, I think, about $25 new at the time. And I think, unfortunately, it's out of print now. Now, this next movie is one that uh, I have a very complicated relationship with, and it's fairly well-known, American movie about Mark Borchardt trying to make a short film to sell on home video to finance a feature that he wanted to make. And uh, this movie was initially sold to me as, oh, look at this Joker, uh, you know, this is how you don't make a movie. And, well, if you're not from the, the right background uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, family and friends that are into the arts, so to speak, it's not as easy as you would think. And I think a lot of people would hit a lot of the same walls that Borchardt did in this movie. So when I see it, I see myself when I was a teenager and in my early 20s trying to make music and, uh, you know, having to, uh, I used to call myself the cat herder because you'd have to try and get people together and to work with you and all. And it, uh, a lot of times it would just blow up in your face and uh, you'd have to maybe try and ask your family for help. And it just, uh, yeah, this was sold to me in a kind of a nasty way, but it, uh, it, it hits way close to home for me. I have to be in just the right mood for this one. Now, of course, I have this. I think I'm required to have this if I'm going to be on the internet, so the room. And I'm not going to discuss it because I think everybody else has already. Now, uh, in, way back when I first started Archive, I was going to do an episode on song poems. So uh, there'd be an ad in the back of a comic book or a magazine. Send us your song lyrics and maybe we'll like it. Maybe you'll get a publishing deal, uh, maybe a record deal, whatever. And like clockwork, you'd send in your lyrics and they'd say, oh, we love it. Send us $300 and we'll cut a record. And so that's what this is about, this documentary, Off the Charts, The Song Poem Story. And it follows some, at the time, uh, contemporary folks that were sending their songs in, uh, thinking it was going to give them their big break, and of course it never happened. But uh, a lot of uh, song poems have been finding their way into the system on YouTube, so I'm kind of reluctant to cover it because I feel like I'd be spending more time fighting with the content ID system over a lot of this stuff. And uh, there's only so much of a history lesson you can give with these because a lot of it is so underground and so sneaky that it's just very tough to do. But I don't know, maybe someday I'll pull it off. But uh, at this point, I'm not really holding my breath. Now, uh, here's one that I haven't even opened yet. I've got a few I haven't opened yet. 
I need to see this. Uh, Keep Off My Grass with Mickey Dolans of the Monkees. And uh, one of my uh, fellow YouTubers, I think, uh, worked on this reissue. And I haven't seen it yet, as I said, but uh, I guess uh, Shelley Berman's only directorial effort, I guess this thing is really bad. I'm kind of reluctant to see this one. So uh, here's another uh, archivism or would be archivism, uh, but in this case it got kind of preempted. Uh, James Rolfe beat me to this one. So what I've got here is a DVD of the pretty cruddy movie Monsters Crash the Pajama Party, which was uh, part of a spook show attraction as they were known. So in this case, they would run this movie and there's a cut within the movie in the middle of it where the monsters and such would just magically spring out into the audience and they'd magically grab somebody out of the audience that just happened to look like one of the actors in the movie and supposedly drag them back into the movie. And um, it would be sometimes in tandem with the spook show thing, I guess. And so you'd have a, a magician that would come to the theater and they would do all these ridiculous gimmicks. And uh, at this point, I think a lot of people would kind of argue very tacky gimmicks. Uh, my personal favorite was come to the show and you might win a frozen dead body. And sure enough, somebody did, but it would just be a frozen chicken from the grocery store. But uh, James did such a good job on this that I just I don't feel like I need to do it. So let's get into uh, actually the last of the DVDs here. Now, uh, one of my favorite so-called bad movies is called The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies, which is from 1965-ish and was made by a guy named uh, Ray Dennis Steckler. And uh, he made uh, like a really early music video for Jefferson Airplane. And he did do some interesting work, but I've been wanting to buy a copy of it on DVD forever. But as I found these very generic looking box sets are the Ray Dennis Steckler collection. There's two of them. So uh, I'm not sure what they were going for here, but uh, on this uh, volume one, we've got Incredibly Strange Creatures and uh, the only other film of his I'd ever heard of, uh, Rat, Fink, and Boo Boo, Adventures of Rat, Fink, and Boo Boo. So uh, I definitely need to crack these open at some point. And uh, the more I've read about uh, Steckler, it sounds like he, he always had no budget, but he by the end of his life, truly had no budget. And stuff like uh, The Hollywood Strangler meets The Skid Row Slasher was shot without sound, with Steckler just overdubbing the dialogue as he pleased. And I guess they get uh, to be a, a pretty tough watch by the end, but uh, certainly the 60s stuff, at least what I've seen of it, is uh, a lot more interesting. So let's get into VHS territory here. Now, um, this movie is kind of infamous in some circles, and I didn't even know it. It was just another thrift store find for me. But Surf 2, which was, I guess, kind of an attempt at a neo-surf movie uh, for the 80s, but uh, you got a subplot with a mad scientist played by Eddie Deason, and it, it's just kind of a chaotic, nonsensical movie. And there is no surf one, I might add. But I didn't know this thing was rare, and I guess the only revival that this has ever had is, I guess Alamo Draft House was running this at one point. But uh, yeah, uh, it, it's kind of a mess. Now, I'm uh, perhaps against my better judgment. I do want to do another cult VHS distributors episode of Archive, in spite of all the trouble I got from YouTube. But I want to cover like some of the public domain uh, labels that I never did. So I don't know if this one ever had any artwork. All I've got is this uh, clamshell case for it. But uh, way, way back in the early days of home video, and I mentioned this in History of Volume 1, 
the some of the early ones were just impatient for the major studios to put stuff out, so they went the public domain route. Well, as far as I know, this is one of the earliest uh, public domain VHS releases from Video Unlimited, or Sound Unlimited, which was more of a record store. It's from 1978, and it's uh, a, kind of a random uh, mix of unusual shorts, uh, I guess with the big attraction being Andalusian Dog by uh, Salvador Dali, best known for watching an eyeball getting slit, uh, a cow eyeball, anyway. And uh, yeah, it's every bit as surreal as you'd expect coming out of Salvador Dali. Now, uh, I've got a bunch of tapes from Interglobal Video. I've mentioned that before, but uh, somewhere down the line, I found a copy of K. Gordon Murray's Santa Claus, which is more of a MST3K riff tracks classic. And for a good reason. This thing, I, I personally can't get through it without the help of at least MST3K. But uh, yeah, I, I, at least I've got it, I guess. Now this one's fairly well known, FM. Uh, the soundtrack was a pretty big hit, but it's a movie that just doesn't have a very good reputation, and I don't know if it's quite deserved. It's not a great movie, but it doesn't stink. And uh, really, it's like watching a really long episode of WKRP in Cincinnati, uh, intercut with uh, concert footage of Jimmy Buffett and Linda Ronstadt. And this is supposedly, you know, a real hard album rock station. But most of the stuff they played was uh, more pop crossover stuff. Uh, you know, Michael McDonald era Doobie Brothers and stuff like that. Now, uh, I mentioned the Monkees earlier. Well, uh, Michael Nesmith had, for a while, what was the biggest selling home video of all time, Elephant Parts which was a cross between a batch of music videos and an episode of SCTV. Well, somewhere down the line, uh, or I guess just after Elephant Parts came out, he took the William Martin segments out of it, and I guess there, well, I know there were more, I've seen this, uh, than what was used in Elephant Parts, and he put out a dedicated video of uh, Bill Martin, who was a songwriter, uh, his little speeches that pop up throughout Elephant Parts. So he's talking about donating to the tragically hip teenagers, which, uh, of course, is where the band got its name. And it wouldn't be a cult collection without some trauma, so here's at least a later issue of The Toxic Avenger. And uh, this one kind of got notorious again a few years ago when Cinema Snob covered it, Wired, the uh, John Belushi biopic, which, yeah, it's pretty bad. I, and I can see why uh, Dan Aykroyd would have objected to it and all, but I just had to pick it up. And I had already seen it well before uh, Brad covered it. Uh, I had seen it on uh, tape uh, by way of Blockbuster uh, probably in the mid-late 90s because I always loved the SNL reruns. I, even back then, I liked the early SNL, the 75 to 79 era. Now, I picked this one up half because it's a big box and half because it just seemed like such a terrible idea. The Jane Mansfield story. So if, if you know her story, you already are halfway there. But we've got Lonnie Anderson playing Jane Mansfield and Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Mickey Hargitay. So uh, this is, it, it's a made-for-TV movie, kind of almost proto-lifetime movie-esque thing. It's a really tough slog. I don't know how I got through this thing. All right, uh, I've got some more in a box here, but uh, I, I have such a mess off camera now, I'm going to need to take a cut. So let's do that and we'll look at some more tapes. And we're back. So I may be wasting my time and breath with this next one, but I guess I'll throw it in. Uh, I was so excited about 15 years ago to find a copy of Howard the Duck because at the time, you just could not find it. It had not been on DVD yet, 
and uh, people just seem to be really hanging on to their copies of it, but now it's kind of considered one of the quintessential bad movies, and uh, it, of course on DVD now, and I've even seen it at Walmart. So uh, I actually read the comic, a couple issues of the comic, before I ever saw the movie, and I saw this back in the 90s, because I liked comic books uh, to a point growing up, but the new ones were kind of expensive for my allowance, but you could buy used ones cheap. And so I could get like Howard the Duck for 25 cents a piece. And um, of course, this is a lot more of a comedy than uh, the comics, but uh, it, it's never bugged me too much. I, I guess I, even back then, I guess I kind of knew what I was in for. Now, this is one that's also been reissued, but I've never uh, replaced my tape of it, Frank Zappa's 200 Motels, and that's because it seems to be the only copy of this movie that was done right. Uh, the laser disc is missing footage, the DVD is in uh, the wrong aspect ratio, and this is in one of those funky in between European kind of aspect ratios, kind of halfway between uh, full screen four by three and 16 by nine. So I've held on to it and uh, it's always a bit of a slog, but somehow I keep coming back to it. Let's see here. Uh, back when I did the last uh, cult VHS distributors episode, I covered something weird video. And I wanted to, for the part where I was talking about the legal troubles that they were having, I wanted to be able to have a VHS copy of a Betty Page movie uh, to draw upon, but it just didn't show up in time for me to make the episode. And I had ordered it f some time before, but it just wasn't showing up. So I had to settle for a digital copy. But uh, yeah, so it's just been sitting in my cult uh, VHS collection. And uh, don't let the title and all fool you. It, it's truly a tease. There is no nudity. Um, if you've ever seen any of these uh, 50s kind of strip tease things, they are very tame. And a lot of it is more uh, bad, misplaced vaudeville comics uh, trying to pace the show and all. But uh, yeah, so this was an archivism that didn't quite happen. And uh, this one did on beta. It's the only beta I've got for you today. Sleazemania Strikes Back, which I covered in the Rhino section of that episode. Just a collection of trailers. And uh, I may have to do this uh, when I get back to going over public domain distributors and stuff. But uh, Unicorn Video... So I've got this big box copy of Your Show of Shows, Sid Caesar. And uh, yeah, boy, this thing is like a ton of lead. It's only one tape, but man, it's, it's uh, very well packed. Uh, some other ones that I will need to at least consider covering. Uh, Grapevine Video, I've got a few of these. They specialized in silence, public domain silence. And for a long time, it was the only way you could see a lot of this stuff. The prints usually weren't very good, uh, a lot of times sourced from other videotapes, but um, I can't really knock them too much. They were, in a way, kind of doing God's work at the time. Uh, Sinister Cinema, I guess I'll need to consider covering at some point. The Spaniard's Curse, which I admittedly have not gotten around to yet. And uh, let's see, also, I've got, here's one that I first saw on a bootleg, and I didn't know it at the time. I had gotten a batch of Betamax tapes, and this was on it, Fade to Black, from 1980. And it's just an absurd movie with the least likable star you could imagine uh, about a movie geek who gets picked on for... Uh, you know, loving movies and just being a, a little overtly nerdy about it. But uh, the beta copy I had seemed to be sourced truly from a theatrical print. But uh, when I saw a legit copy, I just had to pick it up. Uh, I would say this would be good for uh, riff tracks, but it might be a little too violent for them. 
And, uh, I don't know, maybe Joe Bob Briggs could run this or something. And otherwise, I've got only one more tape in this box that I want to share. This is called That's Adequate, which is a mockumentary about adequate studios, where it was all about just making adequate stuff. And it is nowhere near as funny as you would think. This builds it up to be a pretty dang good documentary, but it is just utterly toothless. Uh, I, I don't know what they were getting at here. All right, I've got one more box, and I'll cherry pick a few from those, but I'll need to take a cut so I can, you know, pick it up. And we're back. So I got my last batch of tapes to go through here, and let's just go for it. So this one's pretty well known. My Bloody Valentine. Uh, kind of a late night cable TV classic. And of course I always have to have the MST3K references. So Space Mutiny, which, uh, insert your own dumb names here, uh, Blast McHard Cheese, or some of those other ones from the MST3K episode. But actually, this is one of those uh, MST3K-isms that I like on its own. It, it holds together surprisingly well. I mean, it's cheesy as all hell, but it's watchable, and uh, it's a lot longer on uh, home video. They cut a lot out for MST3K, uh, although I guess they brought most of, if not all of it, back for Riff Tracks uh, a couple years ago. Now, I don't think this really counts as cult, really. Well, maybe a little, but I only bring it out because you just don't see wizard video a whole lot anymore. But we've got a uh, Beyond the Fringe, uh, I guess you could say reunion, and uh, Beyond the Fringe was kind of the breeding ground for all the great British comics of the 60s and early 70s. So a lot of the Monty Python guys were in this, uh, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, so... Yeah, just don't see it a whole lot anymore. Unfortunately, this does not have the wizard logo on the tape itself, but uh, I, I had to pick it up when I found that. So here's uh, one that looks a lot better than it really is. Invisible Strangler, which uh, if you uh, want to pause and read the description, it sounds like a lot of fun. But uh, it, granted, it's been a long time since I've seen this, but I just remember it being kind of a slog to get through. But yeah, real nice cover, though. Nice big box and everything. Now, this next one, I would say I'd like to see Riff Tracks cover it because it's very riffable. You can easily mock it, but it's also kind of a groundbreaking movie, and I don't think Riff Tracks would do it because it's probably too bloody. But uh, yeah, we got... Herschel Gordon Lewis, and effectively the first gore film, Blood Feast, from 1963. And uh, yeah, that cover seems so gruesome at face value, but if you've ever seen the movie, it becomes kind of unintentionally hilarious because the scene is she gets her tongue ripped out of her head, and you do get to see the tongue, but I believe it's a sheep's tongue, and it's huge. It's about as big as her head. It, it's totally implausible. So all I see is that completely impossible scene when I look at this cover. And this is a really early issue, too. Uh, there's actually a date on the tape, uh, you know, on the footage itself saying 1984. Now, I've got a couple of still sealed ones that I'm just kind of reluctant to open, um, you know, collector's items and all, but uh, we got Howling 3 and Salvation, which, uh, yeah, more of a, a Jimmy Swagger parody. And uh, yeah, we got Exine from uh, the band X there. I need to see if I can find an open copy of this, or maybe it's available for download or something by now. Now, this next one may very well be sexist or something. I, I ad admittedly haven't watched it yet, but I had to pick up a movie called When Women Had Tales. And I'm assuming that's a pun, but yeah, I can't confirm that. Uh, this one's on Blu-ray now, I saw on Amazon, uh, but I've still got my old tape of it, Night Patrol, with uh, the unknown comic, Murray Langston, 
and Pat Paulson, the great uh, uh, evergreen politician from the Smothers Brothers show. And uh, yeah, I, I've just held on to this. I, I, even though I could get it on DVD now, it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, probably will sometime. Admittedly, haven't seen this one yet, but uh, how could I turn down the best legs in the eighth grade with Tim Matheson and Jim Belushi? I'm thinking this probably isn't as severe as it looks. Uh, I'm thinking more of those kind of cruddy early 80s teen comedies here. I'd say that's pretty safe, actually. All right, these last ones are, as it turns out, bootlegs. So uh, this one is from Moonlight Cinema, and I thought it was just a public domain label, but I guess they did bootlegs. So we've got a, a Luis Bunnell movie here, and uh, I love those surrealist, late, silent, early talky surrealist movies. But uh, yeah, the tape is completely unmarked. Now, these last two, I thought, were from some sort of short-run mail-order service, but they're bootlegs. So, we've got two from Video Screams, and uh, as of the last time I looked them up, this was a couple years ago now, uh, they still existed, but it looks like they've gone more public domain since then. But uh, what we've got here are two movies. Uh, this one is Dead and Buried. They're only labeled on the front, and I still actually need to take out the record tabs on both of these. Uh, a pretty dull 50s kind of horror creature feature sort of deal. But uh, I didn't know what either of these were when I picked them up. I, I just didn't know the titles. But uh, this proved, out, uh, proved to be the real gem. Horror Project which turned out to be a later project from Claudio Simonetti of uh, the band Goblin, the uh, Italian progressive rock band uh, that also scored a lot of Dario Argento's movies. And it's uh, uh, effectively a concert video. But it's uh, it kind of odd seeing uh, and hearing Goblin-esque stuff in more of a circa 1990 hair metal mode. But as far as I know, this is uh, pretty much it uh, for hard copies of it. As far as I know, there are no legit ones. I could be totally wrong about that. Maybe over in Italy. But uh, yeah. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. I've got a ton more videos that I could go over, but uh, I'm just not going to. This is running long enough. Now, having said that, if you want to see more stuff from the video collection or even the record collection, let me know in the comments, uh, like, specific genres. Do you want, like, just horror movies, silent movies, uh, that kind of stuff? And uh, maybe I'll do one on some week where I just need the quick video to put out. But otherwise, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the little change of pace and the more easygoing nature today. I'll talk to you again soon.